British concert pianist Peter Donahue has had an extraordinary career spanning over 40 years, encompassing a huge repertoire. He was silver medalist in the 1982 seventh International Tchaikovsky competition in Moscow and was awarded a CBE for his services to music in 2010. So I'm really excited that he's joining me today here in London for one of my classical conversations. How can I be? Thank you. Thank Welcome you, Marvin. Peter. Uh, it makes, makes me feel very old to know that I've oh. been in this profession for 40 years, but thank you. Not anyway. at all, not <laughs> at all. Well, I'm going to start straight away by asking you all about your musical education, how old you were when you started to play, kind mm. of what's the catalyst, and you know, do you come from a musical family? Well, I think I do, but not, not in any way professional musicians, but um, I remember my, my mother's parents being very interested in music on a sort of light level light operetta, things like that. And they seem to know a lot of pieces. And um, my mother played the piano because they had a piano when mm. she was young. By the time I was born, she was actually, she'd finished basically playing it, but um, it was there and I was attracted to it. And everyone seemed to know all the tunes. So it, it was in the family, but not in any practical sense. Mm. Mm. Um, I, my parents, my, particularly my father actually, would have basically supported whatever I wanted to do in a big way. The, the, the idea was always in my family that really whatever you decide to do, that's up to you, but you must do it properly. That's so important, isn't it, to have yeah. that support? So if I decided to do something else, they would have also supported that. Um, and I decided to be, from really before I can remember, I decided to be a professional musician of some sort. Not necessarily the piano, although that was what I first gravitated towards, but um, Music just fascinated me in all its forms, including light music on the radio and everything. Mm -hmm. So that's that's how it came about. Um, I was very lucky. I was born lucky. I have to say, I, I don't know how <laughs> it comes about, and I hope it never stops. I, I, sure. Just the most extraordinary coincidences have made things very positive happen to me. Um, and one of them was that my parents didn't know <clears throat> who to ask to be a piano teacher. For mm. me. They had no idea, and they didn't ask anyone. I, they just looked in the book and saw the guy that was closest geographically to where we lived. He was literally a uh, five minutes walk away. And he was a really good teacher. Oh, that, exactly. Because that's the most crucial thing of a lot. Yeah. In the end. Mm -hmm. When you're really... I, I, I did learn the piano from my mother for maybe three years. Um, and not obviously a proper relationship in terms of teacher-pupil. Mm -hmm. um, but then uh, my father persuaded me to go for proper piano lessons. And... Um, and you know, just to be chosen on that basis isn't a miraculous yes. thing because if it had been a bad teacher, that would have been the end of it. And I think that happens so often. Yeah, well, I was about to say which teacher was, was crucial in your development as a pianist because it's well, just saying. Yeah, they've all been great. And you know, he was the first, Alfred Williams, his name was. And Alfred, who probably died in the early 80s, something like that, he was quite an old chap when I first went to him, which was when I was seven, having started at the age of four with my mother. Um, he was a, he was a, a performer. I, I did actually go and hear him play Beethoven's first concerto, maybe a year after I started with him, uh, with a local orchestra. I think it was the Salford Symphony Orchestra. I'm not sure, but I think it was. And you know, he, he was a real musician. He wasn't just someone p picking up a few quid yeah. teaching on the yeah. side. He was really dedicated, and he, he made a very good job of starting me off, mm. getting me to hold my hands properly and yeah. sit in the right position, and all the things that. A lot of um, first-time teachers don't do. Mm, it's crucial. That's Absolutely, it was. And he's, he, he actually had a <coughs> excuse me. He had a slightly acrimonious conversation with my father on the basis that uh, that he didn't really know what to do with me. This was after I don't know four years, something like that. That basically I was totally indisciplined and uncontrollable, and he had to send me to someone else because he didn't know what to do any, anymore. And that's what happened. He sent me to a, a, a wonderful man called Donald Clark, who later, this is going to sound weird, because he was my chemistry teacher at school, <laughs> <laughs> but he later became the director of studies for Cheatham's. He was, 
As far as I understand it, Donald was um, someone who could walk through any degree course that he wanted to in science. He was just naturally very able to do it, but wasn't particularly interested. His, de his deep love was music. Mm. And he, he was, as a chemistry master at Cheetham's school in Manchester, his, um, all his spare time was taken up going to concerts and, and doing private teaching on the piano. Gosh. And he took me on uh, for three years and he was great. He was a good chemistry teacher too. <laughs> <laughs> Dual purpose. Indeed, absolutely. Gosh. So then you went to Cheetham's and... You, yeah, you I went to Cheetham's and then that coincided with starting with Donald. Right. And then um, three years later Donald did the same thing, said I can't control this guy. <laughs> I'm not sure what, what the problem was, but you know, apparently I'm uncontrolled. <laughs> and uh, he sent me off to um, a, to do an interview, actually, or an audition at the Royal Manchester College of Music to see if they would provide me with a, a part-time course, a, a, a visit once a week, mm -hmm. essentially, um, after school, to study with a teacher there. And the person who was supposed to listen to me was the principal, Frederick Cox, but he was ill, and he sent um, someone he obviously highly regarded Derek Wyndham to listen and Derek Wyndham said he wanted to teach me himself and that lasted eight years Gosh. right through the rest of school and then on through university mm. um, and, and also uh, Royal Northern College yes. which it had turned into by then so that was the longest relationship and he was a, also a very fine teacher all three of them absolutely disinterested in, in their own ego but, yes, and their own self-promotion it was all down to doing the best they could for their pupils. Yeah, and I wanted to ask you, because you went to Paris to study with yeah. Messiaen as well, that must, that must have been fascinating. Well, that was, that was at the end of my college career, which was a fairly colourful four years. I didn't know what to do with myself because I hadn't fully, at least at the time when I was making the decision, I hadn't fully decided that I wanted to be a solo pianist. I was just doing it because people kept asking me to do it. It's incredible. I, I, wasn't, yeah. I wasn't convinced that, well, A, that I wanted to do the, be part of the lifestyle that yes. I now enjoy, um, because I didn't really know what it was in advance. And also, I wasn't convinced I was good enough. Simple as that. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether that's really true, but I was very self-doubting. And, and also, I was absolutely fascinated by other music that didn't involve the piano. I played a lot of other instruments, mostly very badly. But one of them was percussion, and I was good at that. Right. I, I, I was, in fact, offered the job in the Halle as a percussion player, which I it turned down in the 70s sometime. And I nearly, I nearly went for it. I could have been a professional percussion player for the rest of my life. I don't know whether I would have found it rewarding in the end. <laughs> Possibly yes. not. But it seemed very attractive at the time, because it was security, and it was being involved in what I then considered to be a very exciting life. Mm. Yes, I can imagine. A member of an orchestra, touring around, playing all these pieces that pianists don't get exposed to. Mm. Um, and all the friends you get as a member of an orchestra. Yes. Which is something we... We never get. We don't really... Get, no, no. It's, it's an opportunity that, that's, that's really not... It doesn't come our way at all. That kind of friendship. Mm. Whether it's real friendship is, isn't another question. That depends on the individual. But it does feel like a, it's a group of... Of, uh, Positions uh, working together. Yeah, comrades. Yes. Yeah. And of course, we're very anti conductor and all that stuff, you know, <laughs> while we're playing this god awful program again. And all those things. Um, I liked that. And I'm very aware of it now that that's what they'll be thinking. Yes. <laughs> Why do we have to have this soloist again? He's been four times before, you know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I can, I, I'm actually very glad that I, I've been exposed to that. So sure. it, was, it was a fun time, really fun time. Um, but then I left, um, as, you, as you say, I went to Paris, um, and it was almost like I was trying to find some way that I could um, continue studying music without doing the obvious route, without going to New York to study at the Juilliard or, mm. or Moscow. So I just didn't want to do the obvious. Um, yeah. And I loved Messiaen. I discovered Messiaen when I was still at school, when, when I was taken to a prom concert in 1969. Um, that still remains possibly the most important formative event of my teenage years mm -hmm. in terms of what I do now. When, when um, the Charles Groves conducted the Tarangalida Symphony yeah. and it was the most stunning event. It was, it was partly because I'd, 
I'd been to London several times as a child, but that was the first time for quite some years I'd actually set foot in the capital and I'd never been to a prom and it was a very hot summer and it was the summer of love and the Kensington, yeah, incredible. <laughs> Kensington Gardens was full of hippies and the Tarangali the symphony is about love and it had love plastered across the poster and they all decided they must go to their first classical concert. <laughs> <laughs> so the audience was full of hippies and they were all doing this. Oh wow. During this, the fifth movement and crying with the emotion of the sixth movement. And it was just a, a, an extraordinary day um, and I, I think it convinced me yeah. <laughs> that that's what I wanted to do. And I did. I was very, I mean, I was ambitious to do something that most most people would have said, you know, I do that. there's no chance whatsoever. Because mm. I played the uh, Tarangali of the Symphony of the Proms in 1986. <laughs> Determination. So, yeah, yeah. Right. but actually the funny thing about it was that I wanted to be in the percussion section when I first heard it, 1969. It, it wasn't really the piano part that attracted me then, but that's what I became known as a pianist. So, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Now, I must ask you, how, how did you develop your technique? Um, who, knows, <laughs> who knows the answer? Were you a, were you a Cherny study practice or Chopin study practice? I was unwilling, but I was persuaded to do Cherny. Um, mm. And more specifically, or more, more um, relevantly actually, I was persuaded to do Hannon. And the reason that's become very relevant is because I do it now. Right. Um, and I recommend other people to do it now as well. And I know plenty of my colleagues who would say that it was the opposite of what we should do, that it was some kind of anti-musical experience that you don't need to do. And I don't agree with them, because I have, I, I've definitely felt many um, improvements in what I do from playing those exercises. Yes, sure. Um, most notably, by the way, in terms of sound, not particularly dexterity, but about sound production and variety and so on. Mm -hmm. Confidence, actually. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, and that was Donald Clark who put me on to Hannah when I was 12. And I was so bored with it. <laughs> and I was so unwilling to do it. And, and Donald used to tear his hair out, uh, what the bit there was of it. Um, and he, he, he threw plenty of tantrums at me. He shouted and bawled and went red and slammed the door and all sorts of things at me because I was so difficult. And that was one of the reasons I just wouldn't play the hand and exercises. But you know how it comes back when you get older. Yes. You remember, oh yeah, yeah. Mm. My father and I had the same relationship. All sorts of things that that he told me I should do, and I resisted, and we argued and argued and argued. And once he died, which was when I was 21, um, I suddenly realised how right he'd been. <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying to please him ever since, you know. That's funny, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, I wanted to ask you also, because you came second in the, in the silver medal in the Tchaikovsky, and you've been a major prize winner at many competitions. Well, sort of. <laughs> did, well, did, how did they shape and change your career? Do you feel that they were, they were really important, or would you have been as successful without them? It's impossible to know, isn't it, mm. what would have happened? No, you, you can't. I, I wouldn't have gone to the Moscow competition had I not done the Leeds competition a year before, which essentially I didn't do, do well at all. Um, I, I've only, I, to be honest, I've only ever taken part in four oh. competitions. But I was a finalist in all four of them. Yes. Um, and didn't actually win any of them. <laughs> uh, but they all contributed a huge amount to, to development. And you can make any negative experience a positive one, I think. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like to think that um, I'm sure you, very few people who are listening to this, and I'm sure you won't remember it, because it, it's a long time ago, but I did the Leeds competition in 81. I do remember it, actually. I remember right, watching, okay. yes. Uh, well, I, mm. I, I actually was the recipient of a lot of sympathy votes from, from that, including the BBC and the Proms and, and various orchestras around the UK, who really f felt that that was a bad result, and, and they kind of put their money where their mouth was, which was wonderful. Mm. For the next year, I was doing all kinds of dates, because of that, that I wouldn't have been doing otherwise. And I was very grateful. Yes. It made me feel that it was worthwhile. Mm. The thing about competitions, and I know this now as a jury member, um, it's one thing to be eliminated from the first round because nobody knows anything about it. It's quite another to make the finals and yes. then come in at the end of the queue, yes. which is what happened there. Um, interestingly, in the 2012 competition in Leeds, I was a guest and we had, um, Fanny Waterman and I had a, a kind of public discussion about the whole thing of competitions. Um, 
whatever came up essentially. And of course, my appearance in the 81 competition was part of what we talked about. And actually, it was really moving and touching. The, the, the content, both on stage and in private, mm -hmm. with Fanny. It was a, a really remarkable, it was sort of closure. It yeah. was great, it was yeah. wonderful. And, that, and the real truth is that that competition in 81 was the reason that I entered Moscow. Mm -hmm. I didn't realise, basically, what a connection I instinctively have with, with Russian music. I had no idea. Apart from Stravinsky, whose music I always loved when I was young, <clears throat> and, which is more European than Russian in some ways anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but during that next year, I, I put a lot of effort into to studying and understanding the great Russian composers and then went to the competition. And it seemed to work. Mm -hmm. I, I, I can't explain it. I don't know. The moment I, I walked into the Soviet Union, with all its problems and difficulties and its climate and all the things that happened, the terrible hotel and, you know, all <laughs> the things, for all of that I loved it there, yeah. and I still do. Mm. And it's not because it, it was Soviet, and it's not because it isn't anymore. It's something to do with the place and the people and the mm. culture. Mm. It's, it's really phenomenal, and, and you know, there's nowhere quite like it. Anymore. It gets under your skin. Like people say about Africa or South America. Yes, I agree. Yeah. You know. Do you think though that competitions can still establish young pianists because we've got so many of them now, haven't we? Do you Too think? Many. Yes. I mean, I was going to say, do you think they actually mean anything anymore in a way? I don't know how else you could do it as a young person. That's the problem. Yes. There are more and more people wanting to be musicians and less and less people wanting to listen, which is a really serious problem. It is. And it includes the musicians. They don't really listen to each other either. Mm. One of the most uh, important aspects, and we just mentioned the Soviet Union, one of the most important things about that culture is the degree to which they all went to each other's concerts. And they discussed it all, you know. It, it, it always conjured up the, an image of Brahms and all his colleagues in the yes. Red Hedgehog in Vienna talking about me. And also the 20s in Paris, you know, Debussy, Ravel, Stravinsky, sure. and all the artists as well, all yeah. talking on mm. this very high level. That doesn't happen anymore. People practice and play concerts. Yes and make recordings, and they're not really as interested as, I know there are exceptions, but they're not as interested as they should be in, in other um, performers, mm -hmm. and learning from each other. <clears throat> Essentially, we're all magpies in the end. We need to be able to do that. We need Definitely. to admit it, that that's very much part of what culture is. Mm -hmm. um, so, if you have a situation where there are less listeners, um, and less opportunities to to start a career. The only possible way is, is a competition there. I, I, there is a huge, and always has been for as long as I can remember, a huge movement against competitions, but you can't stop them. And there's no alternative. I'm mm. quoting Fanny Waterman. <laughs> what are you going to do instead? So you've been on the panel of many competitions, many juries, and what are you looking for when you, mm. when you um, what, 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 is, what is it in a soloist that you want to see for the winner? I wish I could. I wish I could identify it. It's actually not true that I've done an awful lot of it. I, I've been on eight juries. That's quite a few, though. Is it? Okay. Well, I, I would imagine. <laughs> it's, it's certainly very hard work to do yes. it well. Mm. I think it's probably quite easy to do badly, and maybe some do. Um, to be honest, I've never really had any issue with more than a couple of people that I've been involved with on juries. Mm. It's very, very tempting, that, I think, to be, to, to be that, that bad guy, you know, that, mm. that young pianists identify as the one that's a thorn in their side, who's going to make sure they don't do well. It's, it's kind of it's very tempting, because it's a power, a power trip. And of course you must avoid that. You must, at all costs, avoid manipulation, you must... Mm. You must be prepared to listen to someone you've never heard of before with the same ears as one of your own students, you know, and things mm. like that. And it's very hard to do. It's very easy for people to say, he's prejudiced. Yes. Um, and it's, it's very easy to be prejudiced. It's very difficult to avoid it. Um, you have to work extremely hard. You have to make sure you're listening to everyone with equal attention. Mm. You do not go to sleep. You don't complain that it's the early afternoon. You've just had red wine for lunch because you shouldn't be having it if right. you like that. And so on, you know, it, it's, it's a difficult job. And I, I've been 
I've, I've been very critical of juries in the past when I was myself a competitor. Of course, that's what we all do. You spent <laughs> going back to the <laughs> Moscow competition, I, mean, I was there for five weeks. And there's nothing else to do in Moscow in those days, nothing at all. There's plenty to do there. But in those days, you, you stayed in the hotel bar and had a piece of cucumber and, <laughs> and Polish beer and very little else was available. And you talked about the jury <laughs> because that was your, your biggest preoccupation sure. at that stage. Now that I'm regularly on the juries of these things, um, I can see the other side. It's very easy to do, it's, you know, it's, it's very easy to fall into the trap. Mm -hmm. I've been looking out whenever I've been on a jury for an example of someone who is blatantly, well not so blatantly, um, manipulating anything and I honestly haven't really found any. That's good isn't it? It good is. Know, yeah. I, I'm prepared to walk out if somebody does. Mm -hmm. And I, I was actually the chairman of one um, in, uh, in Vilnius, Vilnius Lithuania, a smallish competition but a nice one, very nice in uh, something like 2007 or so, I think that was when it was. Actually, no, it wasn't, it was earlier, 2003 or 4. Um, I, was, I was ready. I was ready to deal with any problems, and the only people I had to deal with were the press. The people on the jury were fantastic. <laughs> Every one of them was so um, determined to do the right thing. Mm, yes. Yeah. And, and not to, to feel that they were part of this imaginary set of, of corrupt, prejudiced bigots that we tend to imagine some of them are. I don't think, if they do exist, I've not come across them, put it that way. In Moscow in 2011, I was on the, on the Tchaikovsky competition jury, which of course was an amazing it's emotional been, experience yeah. because it, it's coming back to the, um, to the place that started me off, sure. at least internationally. And, um, well, I, I was absolutely ready, and I did even say so to the press, to leave, if there was any funny stuff, and there wasn't. I hear rumours of other things, but on the piano jury we had a wonderful time and everyone behaved themselves impeccably and they um, abided by the rules that were set and we didn't talk about things in the bar in the way that you're supposed to not do, you know. I hear stories all the time that people do do that, but if they do then they shouldn't. It's just that I didn't come across it. Sure. Uh, it's very difficult though. Um, my biggest problem with being on a jury will always be Comparing someone who plays generally very professionally in a, in a very experienced way and is a really good musician all round, compare that person with someone who plays one piece really wonderfully yeah. and then the rest of what they play isn't so great. Or it's up and down in some way. Because it could be that, that the, the, the part that they're playing really fantastically well is actually greater than the, the other person. And how do you know how that's going to develop? If, if they get the prize, the first prize particularly, but any prize really in the Tchaikovsky competition produces a career, uh, and there are 12 <laughs> prizes, so you know. Um, if they get one of these prizes, they, they will then experience something that will change their playing anyway. If they don't, they won't experience yes, it. I can so imagine, yeah. it's a very responsible position to be in. And you can, you can destroy someone just by ignoring their great qualities mm. and coming up with a result that, that doesn't represent what they did. Uh, and you can make someone temporarily who shouldn't be made because of some anomaly in the voting system or something. It's very nerve-wracking. Yeah. Yeah. Every competition I've been on has a wonderful atmosphere before it starts. <laughs> in fact, that atmosphere continues on through the first round, and then you make a decision about who goes to the second round, and all of a sudden, you make enemies. And it's inevitable, it, it's yeah. dreadful. Yes, I can imagine that, yes. Yeah. There's actually a photograph somewhere on the, on the internet um, that was taken from the audience when the jury members in Moscow, including me, were sat on the stage in a semicircle, and the announcement was being made of who was going through to the second round. And there's a photograph of me in tears. And I'm not inclined that way, I promise. But it got to me really seriously that, that point. Because we, we had to reduce, I think it was 30 down to 12 people. So 18 people had to be thrown out. 18 wonderful players, though, I'm sure. Almost all of them were yeah. very good, yes. And I, I, I maybe even appeared on the internet when we, when we were being interviewed. 
Maybe I appeared over the top, I don't really know. But I was gobsmacked by the level of all of them. But almost all of them, I can't say 100%. But almost everyone that played was, was wonderful to listen to. And to actually have to tell 18 of them they couldn't go through to the second round really somehow just churned me up. It was awful. And particularly in the case of those who were too old to enter a game. Yes. You know. <clears throat> the last chance. Mm -hmm. But you have to do it. You have to. And the other thing is, by the way, all you can do is contribute a vote, a democratic vote, and 14 people, maybe, or whatever the number was, on the jury all do the same. And what comes out of the machine at the end is the, is the mean average. And so yeah. your own particular design might not be represented anyway. In fact, it very rarely is, say, in all yeah. honesty. Sometimes it is. Some, sometimes it's so obvious that everyone feels the same. But occasionally it varies, and, and you have a, a real... A real um, an obvious disagreement that can't be aired. You can't talk about it. No, no, I can't. And it's imagine. quite right you shouldn't, at least until it's over. Um, and so, you know, somebody's eliminated from one of the rounds of a competition, and instinctively, of course, they hold every member of that jury responsible for that. Of course. Yeah. And that's very difficult. <laughs> well, it's a, bit, it's a little bit disconcerting to know that you wanted them to go through, but they didn't, mm. or whatever. I can imagine, you know. yes. And sometimes the other way around, by the way. <laughs> but you know, it, it's it's um, it's very easy also when somebody thirty years later is a huge success that was eliminated from a jury you were on at some point, and you go to them, oh, I voted for you. Yes, of course you did. <laughs> you know, and of course I wouldn't believe them either. But no. that does happen. Of course it does. Mm. I know it. It happened in Moscow. I know. In fact, I'm not going to name anyone, but I, I know that there was a wonderful pianist who was who was simply eliminated from the first round. And essentially because they, they hadn't been noticed. That's I know that sounds a bit odd, mm -hmm. but it's like, um, I'm, I'm try, trying to avoid being very specific, but if you appear on the first de uh, the first, um, as the first uh, candidate on the second or third day of the first round, mm -hmm. you're in a very anonymous position. Yes. And it's very difficult to be noticed, however well you play. And that can happen, that did happen. I, I do feel feel rather strongly that it just went by went like that. We well, just hope that pianist has found some other way of, of drawing attention to themselves. Absolutely, I suppose. Yeah. That's, that's the thing, isn't it? Well, in fact, for young pianists, it's the ultimate. You might as well go home. In all honesty, in most in most cases, you might as well just leave if you get if you draw number one to play. So much of luck. It's terrible, isn't it's terrible. it? And when I was in Moscow as a candidate in nineteen a competitor in nineteen eighty two. Um, there was a girl who'd been there four years earlier for the same competition and she drew number one for both, which wow. was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. When you consider that there were 104 uh, to choose from, <laughs> she drew number one out of the hat. The Very second sad. time. It was awful, yeah. I, mean, I don't I honestly know how she played because I didn't listen to her performance, but um, it was a little bit, little bit doomed from the start, you know. I want to ask you about um, composers and pieces that you would find most complex or demanding to play, or things that you, you maybe you, you wouldn't necessarily draw, be drawn to playing, or things you've started to learn and you thought, no, this isn't for me, or, or we've had to work really hard at playing. Yes, in, in most cases when that's happened, it, I've come back to it later when I've got a little bit older. Sure. Schumann was one of those. I found, I found everything about Schumann very difficult to understand. The imagination that he had and the and actually the pure technical aspects of his playing must be very different to mine or something because I, I found it extremely difficult to, to come to terms with and I, I left it alone for a long time and then I came back to amongst my favorite composers now and to play as well as to listen to mm. um, but you know it's in my case without without I'm, I'm not in any way bragging about this because it's not necessarily an advantage but I learn things very quickly and sometimes it's too quick sometimes if you're not very careful you have to be you, you have to be very vigilant about not about not relying upon that that talent I mm. suppose it is yes quick memory um, harmonic understanding of the music in a way that yes, of course it's an advantage in some way but in other ways it makes it too easy to get it into your head and to memorise it. 
and, and not to really explore the depths of it properly. And I've probably, for most of my adult life, I've worked on slowing it down, of making sure that when something is coming up that I don't yet know, that I sort of spread it across two years rather than doing it at the last minute, which I could do. Um, it's not good. No. And I can promise everyone, it doesn't matter how, how your brain works, it is not, not good. It is always better to do it slowly. Mm. Um, there was one short notice engagement that I took on in 1976 at five days notice to play Liszt's first concerto in the Halle because somebody was, was ill. Um, and I didn't know it because we all know Liszt's first concerto, but I didn't play it. Um, and I didn't let on that I didn't play it. I just learned it in five days and did it. And it went quite well. Amazing. In fact, it went very well, to be honest. It's quite a difficult piece, but it's yeah. by no means the hardest. <laughs> if it had been Rachmaninoff three, I don't think that would have been remotely possible. Um, but it's not, you know, it's not desperate. But the performance came and went. I did four, I think it was, in the same week. And I would say, I would swear that, what, three months later, I'd forgotten it. Yes, I can, I can imagine. Yeah. But memorisation is obviously no problem for you, we are talking about memorisation. On the whole it isn't, no. So no. You, you've got a kind of photographic memory, or do you have to work at it digitally? I don't know. It's not, it's not really photographic, it's a little bit photographic, but not very, not, not very reliably so. Mm. Um, I, I've, I've learned a new word fairly recently, which is eidetic. Eidetic memory. Apparently it means that you use all kinds of different okay. um, senses. Uh, but it's very solid. It means you use the tactile one, the visual one, the oral one, mm -hmm. all kinds of different things, even smells. I don't, I don't know how that works on the <laughs> <laughs> you know. I've not heard of that before. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it doesn't really work that no. way. But, but you know, if you, if you imagine um, that I know where the page turns are when I'm playing from memory, and I know what the chords look like on the page in some places, but not all places. And then you combine that with physical memory, mm. which, which doesn't really work so well if it's very slow. That works very well if it's quick and difficult to practice. You know? yeah. There's yeah. all sorts of other things come into it. Um, and it, it goes into my memory too easily. And then, of course, if you're not very really careful, it can fall straight out again, particularly under pressure. Yeah, and interesting. For it to be solid in the in the subconscious, that's very important. When it becomes part of you, yeah. Yeah. it's in your blood. Then um, there have been occasional things that you know I felt that I knew really perfectly well, but then a couple of years later I've forgotten all about them. It's it's very strange. I just forget. No, I don't even know how it starts. Sometimes it's a very weird thing how it works, I, and it, it seems to be inconsistent as well. You can't really have a formula. No, that's interesting. Of course, pieces that... Actually, just as a good example of what I was about to say. Um, in 2005, for four years or so, I made my, um, my main project to play and perform as many times as I could, the Bach Prelude and Fugues, all of them, um, which takes a long time. Mm. I think it's three hours, two, ten minutes or something in total. And I did, did them in two concerts, sometimes on the same day. It's the hardest thing I think I ever did. Uh, in so many ways. I'm sure. Yeah. By, yes, I mean, by a very long way, in, in fact, the most difficult. Memorising those fugues under pressure, I mean, playing them from memory under pressure, is just so demanding. Incredibly, I can imagine, to do yeah. all of them. Yeah, well, I only did it once. I could, I could probably play them from memory now in private, but in public it's a different matter. Yeah. And once you lose a fugue, you don't get back. No. You might as well just go <laughs> to the next one. <laughs> uh, I did it once. I did on Bach's birthday in 2008. I did play all of them from memory uh, on the same day, which was so, and it was a coincidence that it was his birthday. To be honest, I didn't even know when we planned the concert, but something made it happen, and it was in Bath Abbey. Lovely. Uh, when the, the environment and the atmosphere and everything mm. was just so perfect for it, and I felt very very at one with it. And it was it was one of the most special concerts I've been involved in. Uh, it's not possible to predict that that'll happen again. It's not possible to be sure. Mm -hmm. I, I certainly wasn't sure the day before that. But it <laughs> did, it worked, it was wonderful. And, um, and it probably is the biggest single challenge from every point of view that, that, that any pianist could ever get involved in. Yeah. The Bartok Second Concerto is nothing. 
but there's <laughs> only the, you know, Prokofiev second, all these things that we do. They're, they're all very difficult, but that's the hardest of yeah. the lot. Yeah, I can believe that, absolutely. Yeah. Particularly for me, you know, I used to be a drummer. <laughs> what do I know about? <laughs> Which composers are you particularly drawn to? What do you really love to play? It's much easier to answer whom I don't get drawn to. <laughs> I, I, the longer I play, the more I love virtually everything. And that's, I don't think, I hope that it's not because I, I, I don't have any critical faculties. <laughs> it's not just that I like playing anything because it's there. You know, I, I just somehow seem to really enjoy more and more, particularly as I get to know it as with, with years, uh, almost all composers. And there are maybe three major composers, fairly major anyway, whom I'm not drawn to. And I'm not going to say who they are. <laughs> but if you have a look at the, the things I play, you can probably work it out. <laughs> well, I want to ask you about British composers, because I think it was in 2001 you started on a whole project of recording yeah. British, I think it was the piano concertos, and it's amazing, yes. you recorded loads. Sir Arthur Bliss and... Yeah. Alan Rawlston and Alec Rowley, to name a few. So what draws you to this style and how did that come well, about? I think, without wishing to make it seem simplistic, I think it's partly because I'm British. And I love British music, um, opera and string quartets and choral music, particularly the, the oratorios of British composers long before I turned to the piano concertos. There's just something, as there is with all nations, there's something unique about the style. Mm. Um, but actually, it was the Russian example that made me suddenly realise just how different we are, how unsupportive of our own culture we, we are That's instinctively. Mm, yes. And when you see the pride of the Russians, which is like the opposite, where actually not just the great ones, but the lesser composers and maybe even lesser performers who are Russian have such support, such belief mm. from their, their uh, friends and families and and well, never mind the public, you know, but the whole thing is so different to the way we regard. I'm not talking about performers, I'm really talking about the music itself. The way the British dismiss their own music. Mm -hmm. There's only Elgar that anyone's actually <laughs> prepared to mention. Literally, there's, there is not a single British piano concerto in the repertoire. No. The standard repertoire, you just don't see one. Um, the one that comes closest is probably John Ireland. But it's not played very often, and it's certainly only regarded as a kind of oddity. Mm. Oh, let's put a bit of British music in for a bit of a change, you know. Um, there's a lot more to it than that, and I have accumulated a library of British concertos of 147 pieces. Um, I would say that 20 of them are probably really great pieces. Mm. One of them is up there with the best globally. And I think that's the Arthur Bliss. Yes. I think Britain and Tippett come quite quite close, but the Bliss is just so phenomenal. And there are so many others. Some of them are worth playing occasionally, and of course some of them are not worth playing, I suppose. So you've got to admit it, every country's got plenty of that. But it's worth giving an airing to, and just to automatically turn away from it because it's from Britain just seems to be so I don't know, I don't know whether it's instinctive or traditional or we're apologetic, aren't we? For yeah, that thing. yeah, it is something like that. Mm. Yes, it's like we're embarrassed to be proud of it. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, the Russians don't understand that. No. They will take the music of... I, I might as well name someone. The music of Dargomitsky or someone. Who is, you know, a, an interesting, rather um, sort of Eastern composer of, I think, the late 19th century, mainly of songs in Russia. And he's hailed as an absolute all-time great by the Russians because he's Russian and because they believe in him. And actually, they're quite right to believe in him. It's just that he isn't Shostakovich or Prokofiev, mm. but he's still an interesting composer, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's a shame. Yes, it's a great shame. What are the greatest challenges about being a concert pianist? Mm. How long have you got? <laughs> um, I think the, mm, the biggest single issue that I... I have to deal with if a young person, a teenager, is thinking of doing it, is that in order to do it well, you really do have to concentrate to such a degree on it that everything else goes by the board. Mm. And if it doesn't work, you're then left with nothing. 
I think that's a real problem and I was terribly lucky in that respect because first of all the education in some way received, although it was a bit quirky, it was actually a very good one mm. in languages and history in particular. So I was able to, to some degree, it's not about being able to do those subjects, it's about relating to other people and not just being a musician. Yes. Mm. And having a knowledge of something that isn't all about music. And I suppose also being able to place the music in context, that does help as well. Um, but I was, I was lucky insofar as I wasn't, as I said before, committed to the piano until rather later than most people are. I was 24 before I actually said, I want to be a pianist. Yes. You know, for all that time I was resisting it. Um, so the challenge to me then, I suppose, was that establishing, establishing that it was worthwhile, that I actually was did have something to offer, even though I hadn't gone the usual route. Uh, I, I suppose in other ways, the repertoire that I played was very 20th century based at the time, particularly in my early 20s, and, and I gradually went backwards. So, sure. mm -hmm. um, I'm not answering your question at all. <laughs> what are the challenges? Well, you, there are so many issues to deal with. You are, you are a soloist, you are perceived by the public and the press and everyone else as sort of in the hierarchy of conductor, soloist, orchestra, sort of, yes. you know, um, the deputy or something in a company, the deputy director. Yes. And the, the orchestra is divided into four men and, and the workers, you know. And it's all a load of rubbish, that, because we're mm -hmm. all musicians and we're all working together. And, and actually getting over that issue is a problem, particularly in Britain because of our instinctive class system and all that. Where, you know, the people who are either at the top or the bottom of what they perceive to be the class system, they, they actually behave in that way. And you have to encourage them to be different, to actually have a voice. Yes. If you're playing in the middle of an orchestra, you do have a voice. And in a piano concerto, it's no different. Mm. Uh, plenty of music, as we all know, plenty of music's got very important parts for all the people in the orchestra. But they have to be convinced that, that what they're doing is important, as well as us. Yes. <laughs> and that's quite hard sometimes, that's one of the challenges. Maybe that, I'm thinking about it because I used to be one of them. I, yeah. was, I was that soldier, you know. I was, I was at the back <laughs> of the orchestra when I was being dismissed by a soloist or a conductor as unimportant. And it, it got to me. I thought, well, you know, this isn't about some kind of um, hierarchical competition. This is about the piece. The guy who's the boss wrote this. And the rest of us are his servants, you know. Um, and that's, that's something that I've, I've found a big challenge over the years, is to get maybe myself out of that frame of mind, but certainly everyone else. <laughs> you know. What does playing the piano mean to you? Um, it's a way of um, justifying my existence. I can't do anything else. I used to be able to play the drums, but, you know, <laughs> that's the thing of the past. What does it mean? Well, it's, it's what I... It's what I'm on earth to do, I suppose. It's as simple as that. Because I started at a very early age to, to play the piano. I resisted the, the sort of purely practical aspect of, of specialising in being a pianist until I was 24. Mm -hmm. And then I decided to go along with it. It's all I've ever done, really. You know, it's, it's, it's what I am. That's, that's what it means. Um, if without it, I would be nothing. But if I decided at the age of four that I wanted to be a naval officer, perhaps the same would have happened then. I don't know, perhaps the Navy would have been my life. I, I think probably that applies to all of us, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, yes. if, if, you, if you have a vocation of any sort. Thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.